Welcome to Real Life Online and thank you for joining us today. Real Life is a church for real people just like you and we want you to know that God is crazy about you. Please take a moment right now and click on the share button and share this experience with your friends and family. This week we are jumping into our new series called Miracles where we will be examining miracles that Jesus performed. When we connect our lives to him in his endless power, nothing is impossible. Today, Pastor Jay looks at the miracle of Jesus feeding the 5,000 and helps us see when we take what God has given us and we lay it at the feet of Jesus, anything can happen. Thanks again for joining us today and let's get ready for Real Life Online. Good to see everyone. Woo. New series today, Miracles. This is a good one. I want to welcome all our locations around Central Florida. I'm so glad you guys are joining us for this because God's doing a new thing at Real Life. And uh, it's, it's been happening in me and I want it to happen in you as well. I'll just catch you up to speed a little bit. I, some of the things that God's just been sharing with me is that he wants us to be a church Right where we allow him and invite him in to do what only he can do. And, and he wants us to experience and encounter him in, uh, in life-changing ways. Our vision's always been changed lives. And you know, when you have an encounter with God, it changes your life forever. So that's what we want. Part of that, because when God shows you things, he also shows you what isn't right, is that some of us have built boxes. Church people love boxes, don't we? We love to put God in a box and say, okay, God, you can have this much, but not this much. You can work in this area of my life, not this area. Uh, Lord, I believe you to do that, but not this. And what God is saying is time to break the boxes. Time to, time to throw the boxes in the recyclables and let them come and pick them up and take them away because I don't want to work in a box. I want, I want you to allow me in to the whole thing. And I think part of this is also uh, there are probably some of us who have stopped believing that the impossible is possible. And we've maybe come to a place in our life where we're just like, we're focused on what we can do, but not what he can do. And, and what I want to encourage you to do as we start this series is just come to God fresh and new and with like a childlike faith. Like, all right, God, you know how I got here, but I don't want to stay here. And so I believe you are who you say you are, and I believe you can do what you say you can do. Nothing is impossible. All right, I want to pray that for us right now. Let's pray together. God, thank you for miracles. I want to thank you that you're the same yesterday, today, and forever. You didn't just do miracles. You still do miracles. And, and a lot of us need them. And, and we, we don't want to just hear a sermon on it, Lord. We want to actually experience it. And so we just invite you into our lives and into this church to do what only you can do. And uh, thank you. Thank you that as we jump into your word, it's living and active. And, and it comes to life in us. And so, Lord, move in your church. Move in us. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Boom. We're off to a great start, right? And, and today, miracle series, John chapter 6 is the miracle I want us to focus on first. It's the feeding, we call it the feeding of the 5,000. John chapter 6. And, uh, you know, of course, what we call a miracle, Jesus calls business as usual. It's just what he does. What is supernatural to us comes naturally to him. And so he does miracles and he's like, whatevs, no big deal, basic. But we're like, whoa, what was that? And, and we're going to experience one of those today. John chapter 6, starting in verse 1. Sometime after this, Jesus crossed to the far side or the far shore of the Sea of Galilee, that is the Sea of Tiberias. And a great crowd of people followed him because they saw the signs that he had performed by healing the sick. And then Jesus went up on a mountainside and sat down with his disciples. I've been to that mountainside, beautiful area on the other side of the Sea of Galilee, and, and where this miracle probably took place. The Jewish Passover festival was near. When Jesus looked up and saw a great crowd coming toward him, he said to Philip, where shall we buy bread for these people to eat. He asked this, check this out. He asked this only to test him for he, are, God bless you. It just wouldn't have been right to let that go without saying that we're in church. Okay. 
He asked this only to test him, for he already had in mind what he was going to do. Stop for a second, because I have a problem with this. I don't think it's fair that Jesus is asking trick questions. Didn't it just say that Jesus asked him this only to test him? I'm like, hold on, hold on, hold on, Jesus. We're already not that smart, right? You call us sheep. You know that. I mean, how many encounters does he have with his disciples where he's like, guys, are you kidding me? So, so you're already God, and we're clearly not, and now you're asking trick questions? That's just not fair. It's not, it's not only not fair that Jesus does it. It's not fair that he creates women in his image. <laughs> guys, I, are you with me here, Okay. Because this is one of the ways we know that women are, are, are more like Jesus, I guess, because y'all do this to us. And I don't understand because I'm just a guy. And if you want to know an answer, you just ask me a question and I'll tell you. But I don't understand trick questions. Jesus coming at me with trick questions. My wife coming at me. Ladies, you'll do this. Uh, girlfriend, wife, guys, you're sitting there. And what will she do? She'll be like, point to a supermodel and she'll say, isn't she beautiful? And then look right at you because you know it's a test. You can't say yes. You know that will end in a bad place. But you also can't say no because then you're lying. Isn't she beautiful? Ah, trick question, right? And, and women will ask us things like, what are you thinking? What are you, what are you thinking about? And you're like, okay, no way I can get this one wrong because the only person that knows what I'm thinking about is me. And so this has to be the right answer. What are you thinking about? Nothing. That's impossible. You can't think about nothing. You have to be thinking about, I, I, no, I just was, actually. I was enjoying it, too, till you interrupted. But, like, okay, fine. What were you thinking about before that? Pretty sure I wasn't thinking about anything then either. Well, how about before that? Well, before that, I was trying not to think about the supermodel that you pointed out, okay? <laughs> These trick questions. I can't answer them. You know, I, um, how, how do I look in this new red dress? You know, do you like this? How, how do I look? I'm like, I, red. You look red, right? Because I'm thinking this is a trick question. No, do, but do I look good? Guys, that's an easy one, right? Of course, you look amazing. You're just saying that because you think that's what I want to hear. <laughs> so confused. Trick questions, man. Uh, does this dress make me look fat? <laughs> Run, right? You can't answer some of these questions. <laughs> Jesus. <laughs> You know, it's bad enough that our wives do it and ladies do it. But Jesus now, he's asking trick questions. Poor Philip, right? He asked this only to test him. He already knew what he was going to do. And, and so we, what we don't know, all right, because Jesus is questioning Philip. Interesting that he picks Philip. I think he picks Philip because Philip's from this area. So it's like, okay, this is your hometown, bro. How are we going to do this? Where, where does a dude get food for 20,000 people around here? That's what we find out. The crowd was 5,000 men. Uh, possibly up to 20,000 people. We're not going to be able to solve this problem. Don't know what the right answer is. It's a trick question. I mean, I'm assuming it was something like, well, sir, you know, to feed a crowd this size, it would take a miracle. But miracles are your specialty. That, that would be a good line in the Bible, right? You could almost insert that and go, that's the right answer. We don't know what the right answer was. We do know what Philip's answer was. This is interesting. In, in verse number seven, Philip answered him, it would take more than half a year's wages to buy enough bread for each one to have a bite. Now, this tells us a little something about Philip. You got those number crunchers? Any number crunchers here? Some of you, the analyst, your brain is wired to solve problems and you need data. You go, okay, oh, oh, there's a problem. Hold on. Crunch, slide rule, you figure it out. Philip is that kind of guy and he's like, okay, let me run some numbers. You're saying we, we got to feed this crowd and, and he comes up with, that it would take more than a half a year's wages, more than, not exactly half a year's wages, not all the way to a year's wages. You know these people. Some of you are these people. And we love you, but you're hard to live with. So, um, <laughs> but check this out because there's another personality type. Another of his disciples, Andrew, now Andrew's Simon Peter's brother, spoke up. Here is a boy with five small barley loaves and two small fish, but how far will they go among so many? So you've got Philip, the analyst. You've got Andrew, the action guy. Isn't that, like if you're married, there's, one of you, there's, there's both of you in the marriage. And that's why you're here for counseling. So two different personality types. The one is trying to think it through and he's crunching the numbers. He comes to a conclusion. Can't be done. It's impossible. It would take way too much and we don't have enough. The other guy takes action. Where he's thinking about it, he's doing something about it. He starts confiscating lunch boxes. Hey, little boy, come here, come here, come here. He's an usher, right? You know this guy. 
And, and, and so he's trying to solve the problem on his own, comes to the same conclusion, can't be done, there's not enough, because what are they missing? Jesus, right? For those of you who were afraid to answer, it's almost always the right answer. It's church, okay? Even if you say Jesus and it's the wrong answer, it's still the right answer. So yeah, they're missing Jesus. The answer to the question is the one asking the question. And so what they fail to factor in is God in the flesh is with them. And John actually tells us they had already seen him do miracles. It's not like this is the first miracle. They'd already, they've just come from uh, an experience where he's performing signs and doing healing so they know that he can. I think the problem is that, that they are more focused on what they can't do than what Jesus can do. You with me? Because I'm going to take a guess. You're doing this in your life right now. In some area with some problem, some situation that you're dealing with and struggling with. Instead of bringing it to Jesus, you're busy working it out on your own. But it's not working out. And Jesus says, apart from me, you can do nothing. But we say, let me try. God says, not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord Almighty. We say, I can handle this. I got this. Let me figure it out. And just like Philip and Andrew, we fail the test. Because it is a test. It's a setup to see if we'll look up. Because check this out. Miracles always start with a mess. Have you noticed that? Miracles always start with a problem that can't be solved. So some of you came here today and you're like, whoa, 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 man, I, my life is a mess. I just, I, I'm not going to be able to make it. And, and while you think there's no hope, I just want to tell you, you're in the first stage of a miracle, right? Because miracles always start with a mess. They start with a problem that can't be solved. Looking at my finances and just going, I, I don't, I can't pay this, this much with this much, right? You ever been there? I'm trying to pay all these bills, but I don't have enough money, and so I'm working through this. But it, unless something happens, unless that job comes through, or that promotion or that check, and we're out of options. Maybe an addiction. And I've been doing this thing my whole life, and I've tried to change, and I can't. And so why would this time be any different? I just don't have the power to make it work. You know, maybe in your marriage, there, there aren't enough counselors in the world to fix this. And I'm at the end of my rope. We call them irreconcilable differences. We just can't work it out. Maybe some of you wish your problem was marriage because you're single and you've been waiting and you've been praying and you just haven't found that person. And so you're ready to settle for someone that is definitely not God's will for your life. Maybe it's some pain that, that just doesn't seem to want to go away. Or maybe it's your kids and you've tried everything but they're just not where they need to be or this divorce is killing me. But listen, miracles always start with a mess. With some problem that I can't solve. And so I'm doing the math. I'm running the numbers. It's not working out. And I'm out of options. Because I'm looking at the size of the problem. And I'm looking what I have to deal with it. And it's hopeless. But what we're missing is the same thing the disciples were missing. Right? That the, the answer is actually in the question. Check this out. I read it, but we missed it. Let's go back to verse 5. When Jesus looked up and saw a great crowd coming toward him, he said to Philip, where shall we buy, hold on, what did he say? Where shall we, okay, notice Jesus never said, hey, Philip, here's a problem, how are you going to solve it on your own? He never said you, he said we, that this is a you and me thing, because if I remain in you and you remain in me, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. But it wasn't supposed to be a you thing. It's supposed to be a we thing. How are we going to do this together? Jesus says, take my yoke upon you. And, and so we're going to pair up like two oxen. I'm going to show you a picture because some of you don't know what I'm talking about. That, that yoke, Jesus says, here's the thing. It's not a you thing. I want to come alongside you. And so there's me and Jesus right there. He's the strong, good looking one. <laughs> it, it, we're going to pair up together because you can't do it, but we can. And when I turn my me problems into we problems, that's how miracles start, right? When I invite him in to do what only he can do, the answer is in the question. How are we going to do this? God's plan isn't me, it's we. And I'm with you, he says. And so when I take a we problem and I make it a me problem, I'll fail that test every time. I think, okay. So you guys know I'm not the best mechanic, 
right? Have we established that? I think we have. In case you forgot two words, grease gun. There you go. Yep, uh uh-huh. You were there. Um, Grease gun. So we'll go back that. If you missed that, you just missed it. I don't know. Go online. You, You need to know. But recently, okay, so I got teenagers. Teenagers need cars. And so I'm not a great mechanic. And so now we have a problem. Recently, my son Elijah needed front struts for his car. And that's not a me thing, right? He comes to me, he's like, hey, I need struts for my car. Friend, help me figure out what it was. And that's not a me thing. That's not an Elijah thing. And so he's asking mechanics. He's getting prices. He's getting quotes. Best quote he got was about $550, which is too much for a teenager. Probably a good price, but he doesn't have it. And so he starts scrambling. He's putting things into motion. Goes on Amazon, and he finds the parts he needs for $155. Thank you, Amazon, right? There, 550 versus 150. That's, we can't do it. Now maybe we can. He orders the parts. We get the parts. Uh, they, they drop them off. I see the lady walking away. I was like, hold on. She's like, yeah. I was like, they're still in the box. We need them on the car. Like that's, they dropped off the parts, but we still have a problem because now we have the parts and we have the car, but we have to put them on. And all my tools are pink and Robin says I can't use them. So not sure because it's not a me thing we got to fix this problem. Then I'm at church. This is so cool how God works. And I run into my friends Bill and Terry. Hadn't seen them in a while. We're talking in the lobby of the church. And Bill and Terry are brothers. And they said, hey, you know we got a shop, right? And I'm like, what? What kind of shop? And they're like, like an auto shop uh, with a lift and with all these tools. And we, we love to work on cars. And it's at Bill's house. It's right across the street from you. If you ever want to come over and work on a car. If you ever need anything for any cars, just come on by and we'll knock it out. I'm like, how about tomorrow? <laughs> what a gift, right? And so we get over there in, uh, in Bill and Terry's shop. There's a picture of Elijah working on his car. Isn't that a great pic? See a young man working on his own car. I had him pose for that. <laughs> because So here's the reality, all right? While Elijah can definitely say, we did it. We got that car fixed. Uh, Because he was there, he helped, he got his hands dirty. The truth is, we, like, didn't really, Terry and Bill, without the shop, without the tools, without the lift, without knowing how much torque to put on the wrench, without Bill and Terry, while we did it, we needed them for the we, right? Otherwise, we would have a car out front of our house on Jack's hashtag redneck lawn ornament. Some of you know what I'm talking about. And it just sits there because the ferry never comes and fixes it. That's why I don't live in an HOA neighborhood. But (laughs) the truth is there are some things, though, in life we can't do on our own. Uh, There are a lot of things that I can't fix this in my own power. And and that was really never the plan. What Jesus wants to do is Jesus wants to turn my me problems into we problems. And the stuff I'm trying to figure out but I can't. The stuff that I'm trying to fix but I keep coming up short. He's saying, hey, factor me into that equation. Bring me in. Get me involved. Invite me in and let's make this a we problem. And when I do, that's when miracles can happen. Everything changes when we get Jesus involved. So check this out. Uh, We go to verse 10. Jesus said, okay, here's what we're going to do. Have the people sit down. Now there was plenty of grass in that place and they sat down. About 5,000 men were there. So that's probably about 20,000 people. Jesus then took the loaves, he gave thanks, and distributed to those who were seated as much as they wanted. Woo, some of you go to Olive Garden because of the free breadsticks. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> this is what's happening right here. As much as they want. He did the same thing with the fish. It's all you can eat at Red Lobster. Thank you, Jesus. When they had all had enough to eat, he said to his disciples, gather the pieces that are left over. Let nothing be wasted. And so they gathered them and filled how many baskets? Twelve, twelve baskets. Why twelve? Because twelve disciples, right? I want each of you to have a disciple doggy bag to take home to your families to tell them what just happened with the pieces of the five barley loaves, little biscuits left over by those who had eaten them. Okay, we're going to review. Not all of us are math people, right? Some of us are pastors. So we're going to review. Five loaves plus two fish equals not enough. Right? And, and, and Philip tried to solve that problem and do that math. Andrew tried to solve that problem and do that math. But five loaves plus two fish is not enough food to feed 5,000 men, 20,000 people. It's insufficient. The problem is bigger than the solution. But, but check this out. Five loaves plus two fish plus Jesus. Right? 
Five loaves plus two fish plus Jesus. When you add Jesus into the equation, all of a sudden, you're not enough becomes more than enough. You add Jesus into that same equation and all of a sudden what was not enough is now a miracle where it's a feast for 5,000 men and 12 disciple doggy bags to share with their friends and neighbors because that's what Jesus does when we allow him to do what only he can do. When we take what we have, okay, even though it's not enough, when we take what we have, even though it's insufficient, it can't fix our problem, it's not enough to solve our situation, but when, but when we take what we have, and we give it to Jesus, our not enough becomes more than enough. Amen. Somebody's got to testify because not everybody believes it, right? When we take what we have and we give it to Jesus, our not enough becomes more than enough. And, and that's what he's wanting to do. That's how miracles start. So whatever you're facing right now, the only math you need to know is that anything plus Jesus, it's enough. Anything, like whatever your situation, your problem plus Jesus, problem solved. Your hurt plus Jesus equals healing. Your addiction plus Jesus equals freedom. Your broken marriage plus Jesus equals hope. Your lack plus Jesus equals overflow. Whatever your situation, you know, your emptiness plus Jesus equals everything you need plus something to share. And this math works every time in every situation because Jesus is the difference. He's the answer. He's the integral integer in the equation. The question is, are you factoring him into your formula? Are you focused on what you can do? Are you inviting Jesus to do what only he can do? You know, when you take what you have and you give it to him, that's how miracles start and how you're not enough becomes more than enough. I, I recently had an opportunity to talk to a friend down in South Florida, and he's, he works at a rehab center there. And he was sharing his story with me, and I'm like, dude, your story is so powerful. I just, just jot it down for me because I want to share it. This, I want you to hear Mikey's story. There's a picture of, of Mikey. Good dude, man. Uh, he says this. I grew up in Rhode Island in a great family. They gave me everything I needed, but I broke my wrist my senior football season in 2006. I needed surgery, and I was given pain medication that I eventually became addicted to. As the addiction to the meds progressed and my habit continued to grow, the pain medication stopped working. I was introduced to heroin. My life began to spiral. In 2009, I was headed to the University of Rhode Island on a baseball scholarship, still in the grips of a heroin addiction. Heroin was my only focus. Nothing else matters. And so I was kicked off the team my freshman year because I was unable to keep the proper GPA. My life began to spiral even more. 2014, I was getting on a plane to South Florida to check into my 17th treatment center at the age of 24 years old. In the grips of a heroin addiction, there was no hope in sight. Laying in bed, detoxing, cold sweats, body shaking, throwing up, just feeling like I was going to die. Suicide seemed like the best option. I began to reflect on my life. 17 treatment centers, homelessness, lost all my relationship with family and friends, heroin addiction. What was the point anymore? He says this, for the first time since I was a kid, I slowly got off the bed. I could barely hold myself up. I got on my knees and I prayed to God. I asked for his forgiveness. I asked for a chance at a happy, healthy life. I asked him to rid me of this disease of addiction. And on August 12th, 2014, I found God and I found sobriety. He says, I, uh, I've never picked up a drink or a drug since. And I get on my knees every morning and every night and pray to God just like that day in detox. Now, not only has God delivered me, but I've been working in the field of recovery for over four years. And I help people with addiction every day. I travel around the country. I speak to youth. I share my struggles. And I spread the message of hope that it is possible and God is the answer. He's the solution, the only solution. Come on, that's a great story of life change. Because when we take what we have, right, even though it's not enough, when we take what we have and we give it to Jesus, our not enough becomes more than enough. And it's not just enough for us, but it's, it's more than enough so that we have something to share and give back. And that's not just a story that we read in the Bible. That's, that's real life today. It's not just Mikey's story. Listen, I'm not up here because I'm teaching you guys history. I'm up here because I know a guy who's changing my life. And I know what it's like to have... Jesus come into my emotional life where I, 
I was out of control. Anger and depression and, and, and for Jesus to come in and wake up with a peace that passes all understanding. That's a beautiful thing, man. I, I've seen him show up in my marriage when I, I just, everything I tried wasn't working, but my failure plus Jesus equals more than enough. And our marriage is so blessed and I love that girl and I might just pray right now and go kiss her. So I'm just saying when he shows up, I've seen it financially. We've been trying to balance the books and it doesn't work. And unless God shows up and shows off, we're in trouble. But guess what? When we invite him in, he does. I've seen it with my kids. I don't know. I, I mean, I have three teenagers. That's probably three too many sometimes. But I, we have three teenagers and I love them and I'm blessed. And, but there are times, right, where you, you struggle and you're trying to relate and connect. And maybe you don't see what God is doing and there's been times I want to drop that dad hammer but instead we went and prayed and I've come out and, and that very same kid comes up to me and says hey I'm, I'm really sorry I haven't been myself lately so I, I'm working on it and God's working in me so love you and I'm just like well huh like because teenagers don't do that that's Jesus right like because when we do what we can do we get what we can get right but when we give it to God our, our not enough becomes more than enough and I'm just saying what what in your life right now, what challenges are you facing? And maybe you're trying to fix it on your own, your own resources, your own intellect, your own capacity. Or are, you, are you trying to fix it on your own? Are you taking what you have and giving it to him? I think some of you are so focused on what you don't have, you know, that you're maybe failing to give him what you do have. Well, this isn't enough and I don't have enough. And, and just take what you have and give it to him. It's time to turn those me problems into we problems and invite him in. I don't know what test Jesus has you taken right now, but I do know he's the answer. Amen. I don't know what questions that are, are going on or what problems you're facing. But is there some area of your life where you're coming up short and realizing I'm not enough. I don't have enough. Hey, put it in his hands and watch him work. And he'll not only turn it around for you. But you'll be taking home doggy bags of blessings to share with the people around you. Because that's what Jesus does when we invite him in to do what only he can do. I don't know. You ever think about some of these miracles? It's like, why did he do it that way? Right? If you're Jesus, I mean, if you have all power, that I think, like, why does he do this miracle this way? He had options. We know for sure Satan tempted him. He says, hey, turn these stones to bread. So somehow Jesus, he could have done that. Even Satan knows that he could have just, I think that would have been a cooler miracle, personal opinion. Right? You got all the disciples like, hey, we don't have enough bread. Oh, yeah, watch this. Bread starts popping, stones just turn into bread, right? And Andrew, what's that smell? I don't know, Philip. It smells like a bakery. Wow, Jesus, great job. You know, like, I just think that would be an amazing miracle. But he doesn't do it like that. Why? Because I think part of this miracle is, isn't just what Jesus wants to do. It's what he wants to do in us. Not just for us, right, but in us. And so he says, here's what I need from you. I need faith. I can do it, but here's what I need. I need some trust. I, I need you to take something and put it in my hands so that I, you can see what I can do with it. You know, and that's really the key to this miracle. It starts with something. Not enough. It starts with something not much. But, but I believe that what Jesus wants to say to us today is, hey, that miracle that you're looking for, that you need, are you willing to trust me enough to give it all to me? To take what you've got and put it in my hands. And, and when we do that, that's when miracles can happen in our lives. I don't know what you're starting with today, but I do know that's not what Jesus wants you to finish with. Right? There's more, way more, immeasurably more than we could ask or imagine. More that he wants to do for you but also more that he wants to do in you and through you. And so what he's saying to us is just, hey, take what you have, give it to me, and watch your not enough become more than enough. Put it in my hands if you need to do that today. This is, you know, church, man, Jesus comes and he hangs out with us. Two or more are gathered. And, and so if you need a miracle, he's your guy and he's here. And so what I want to encourage you to do is, is just, if you need it and you know it, just let him know. And as I think most of us just close our eyes and bow our head, if you know that this is for you today, that you didn't come here just needing a message about a miracle, you, you came here needing a miracle. Just, just stand up and let him know. If you have something you need to place in his hands, maybe because you need him to restore it 
or repair it, maybe even resurrect it because it seems like it's too far gone. But he can do that. I'm just saying like he's right here. And, and if you invite him in to do what only he can do, you're going to see a miracle in your life. Just stand up and let him know. Lord, I want to pray for you right now. Lord, thank you that you can. That you're the same God yesterday, today, and forever. And, and you didn't just do miracles back then. You do them today and we need them, Lord. I want to thank you um, that you're willing, that you're able. And I want to thank you for those who are standing right now. Because we're, we're standing because we need you. Because we know what we have is not enough. And so we're coming to you and we're just saying, Lord, take what I have. And, and take my not enough and make it more than enough. Do what only you can do. I believe, Lord, some are probably standing because of maybe addiction. And in their own power, they cannot break the stronghold or the bonds of temptation and addiction. But, but where they've had failure, Lord, as they bring that to you, they can have freedom. And so just, just enter in and show them, be glorified. Lord, I believe some are probably standing because of broken relationships, maybe a marriage that they just can't seem to mend. And, and, and where there's been hurt, I pray you will bring healing. Some of us are standing because of loss and grief and pain and it seems like we can't move on. But you are the God of all comfort and I pray that you, you comfort them. Not only for them but to overflowing like it says in Corinthians. So that we'll have comfort to share with others. Lord, fill them to overflowing. The peace that passes all understanding. Lord, I know some are standing because they need healing. And they're at the end of their rope and they're just saying, all right, Lord, if you can, if you will, I'm just here. I'm willing to let you do what only you can do. And so would you enter that space and show up and show off in their lives. And Lord, while this is for our good, it's also for your glory. We want to be changed so that people can see who you are and what you can do. And we love you and just thank you, God. Thank you for showing up. In Jesus' name, amen. What a challenging and inspiring message from Pastor Jay. If you have any questions or are in need of prayer, we would love to hear from you. Please go to real.life slash connect and someone will reach out to you soon. We want to remind you that if you are in the Orlando area, we would love for you to join us at one of our Central Florida campuses. You can find out more about our locations and service times by visiting us online at real.life slash locations. Also, if you would like to stay up to date with what God is doing here at Real Life and always know when we go live, subscribe to our YouTube channel now. You can follow us on social media, download our app, or check us out online at real.life to stay plugged in. Once again, thank you for joining us today, and remember that God is crazy about you.